I will go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Science Circle. Um, and note that there is a talk tomorrow as well that you can find on the Science Circle's uh, website or notices for the group, things like that. I am Rob Knopp. I am a professor of physics at Westminster College, which is a tiny liberal arts college in western Pennsylvania. It's in fact a little tinier than it wants to be right now. We're having issues with recruitment, which is kind of sad. I have been lots of places in my life, and I know everyone has, right? But I've had, I think, four, no, only three different affiliations since I've been giving talks in Second Life. Uh, I can't actually remember. I may have given my first talk with Troy McLuhan in the Science Center while I was still at Vanderbilt, but then I was with uh, Linden Lab. I actually worked at Linden Lab for a couple of years, and I was associated with MICA during that time, and then I was at Quest University, and now here I am at Westminster College. So, um, yeah, hopefully I, I stop moving around a lot, but there you go. And today I am going to talk about, well, what was it? It says uh, discrepancies in the measured expansion rate of the universe, but um, I think it was Allison, my wife, who asked me, what are you talking about? And I said, oh, tension in the Hubble constant. And, you know, and you get a funny look. What the heck is that? Tension in the Hubble constant. Oh, that's discrepancies in the measured uh, expansion rate of the universe. That's what that means. But if you're an astronomer, you hear tension in the Hubble constant, and you know, oh, yeah, I know what that is. So I'll be talking about that. Now, so I've been giving these talks in Second Life, I think, 10 years now. It's close to 10 years, if not. I don't know when I did my first MICA public outreach talk. Um, and I have, there's a few topics, if, if you've been coming to my talks for a long time, you learn that there's a few topics I seem to like to go back to. Um, you know, I'm always talking about black holes because, I don't know, they're just kind of cool. I also like to talk about cosmology a lot. And here I am talking about cosmology again. And if your memory is better than mine, you will actually probably recognize a couple of the slides because I am using some slides I've used before. I was very happy to discover that I have a little demo 3D object here that I made for a previous talk that I can use again because I was thinking, oh, I'm going to make this. And then I didn't because it was already there. So you'll see that a little later. So um, first of all, if you want to understand why tension in the Hubble constant means discrepancies in the measured expansion rate of the universe, you need to know what the Hubble constant is. Uh, that's where I'll start, and now this is when I realize I haven't attached my controls to my HUD, so let me do that. Oh, no, um, because I did a thing, and I foolishly set up a filter and then I forgot that I did it, so now I can't find things. Okay, I found things. Sorry. Um, I apologize for that little delay there. But now that I have this HUD up, it should, if the texture ever raises. Yeah, I just guessed. Well, anyway, so I'm going to start by talking about what the expansion of the universe is like anyway. Uh, the expansion of the universe is one of those things that it sounds pretty obvious. Everything's getting farther apart, and that's correct. And then you hear Big Bang, and you think, oh, it's great. It's like an explosion. And it's really not like an explosion. Um, you know, there are it shares some common features with explosions, but it's not really like an explosion. It's kind of a different thing. So um, in order to get grips on it, what I one of the things I like to do is, is drop down a dimension. We have this problem that the universe is three-dimensional. I, mean, I guess that's not really a problem, right? We'd probably be in trouble if we didn't have that. But the universe is three-dimensional, and then it's expanding through time, and Einstein's relativity tells us space and time are all unified, so it's a four-dimensional structure, and that gets really boggling to visualize. So you could visualize three dimensions, but then if you want to understand three dimensions but non-Euclidean three dimensions, it gets really hard. So I often go down to two dimensions. And so what I've got here is a um, model of a, yeah, this is the balloon analogy more or less. This is a model of a closed universe, whatever. It's a finite universe. It's just the surface of the sphere. So, and I think, there's one of these problems, I think this happens in general relativity a lot, where there's analogies we make, and people look at them and get a feeling of understanding about it, and they're actually completely misinterpreting the analogy. I talked about that with the uh, embedding diagram 
a month ago. So what's important about this is that the universe is the surface of the sphere. It's not that, oh, it's everything inside the sphere, and the sphere is the edge. Nope, there is no edge. Because if you think about the surface of the sphere, if you move around on the surface of the sphere, you will never come to an edge. You will eventually come to a place you have been before, but you will never come to an edge. So that would be this universe. Now, our real universe could be the three-dimensional equivalent of this, but it's more likely, well, okay, I don't want to say what it's likely globally because that, that'll just get me in trouble. Um, we tend to uh, model it as infinite, which means if it's the 3D equivalent of the sphere, that sphere is so freaking big that we can't tell that it's not just infinite. But this is one that you can kind of get your handle on. And because it's a two-dimensional, um, oh my goodness, yeah, you could, except the truth is you don't really need, again, it, we can stretch it even without that analogy, right? You don't even need that higher dimension to do anything. So it's not, um, it's not really a membrane, it's just a surface that happens to be non-Euclidean. Uh, there's only two dimensions on the surface. We can call them north, south, and east, west if we want. You could call it theta and phi. You could even call it x and y, whatever. You can give them names, but just like in our universe, we have x, y, and z, and there's lots of other names we can give to it for these sorts of things. But x, y, and z are the three dimensions we can move in in space. Here, there's just two, north and west. Uh, yeah, well, so, um, Sissy, it, it, it embeds the universe in a higher dimensional space for purposes of visualization. But um, the math of all of the stuff works even if it's not really there, yeah. So yeah, so these things sometimes are called embedding diagrams, although this is more of a qualitative embedding diagram, whereas the one I showed for the black hole a couple weeks ago was actually a quantitative embedding diagram. So here, you've got two directions you can go, and what that means, if you want to talk about the distance between galaxies, it's not what we, so for, all right, so as Sissy Yee says, we are basically hyperdimensional, three-dimensional creatures um, into which this two-dimensional universe is embedded. Um, and we would say, oh, you just kind of go straight, you know, drill into the sphere and go across, and that's the distance between the galaxies. And that's not what people in the universe would say. People in the universe, if they wanted to figure out the distance, what they would do is they would travel in a straight line from one to the other, but in this universe, this straight line would follow this path, it's just like when planes fly on Earth. If you look at a map of planes flying, you see them curving. Why? Ultimately, because it's the projection of the map. Um, yep, you follow a geodesic is the name for it. And, um, uh, well, in Tagline, it actually, it turns out that um, space behaves nearly Euclidean in small neighborhoods is one of the core principles of general relativity, except where we have uh, singularities, but we won't really go there. Um, so, anyway, so that would be distance between the galaxies, and then when the universe is expanding, you just imagine this whole balloon blowing up. But an important thing about it, um, yes, so, uh, artifacts of Mars, that's, I'll, I'll get to that. That's one of the, uh, core things of this talk. We'll talk about how we know the universe is expanding. So, um, but right now we're trying to just visualize what it means to say the universe is expanding. So you just imagine this is a whole balloon, and it just stretches, but the, um, the uh, galaxies don't stretch with it. So let's see. So if you look over here, I've got a um, 3D version of the same thing. Um, and now I'm walking off the edge. Okay, there we go. Packet loss is a thing. Um, 3D version of the same thing. I'm going to make it expand, and it's probably going to swallow some of you. And, you know, being swallowed by the universe, there's worse things that you could be eaten by. It will be a little jerky because just of the way it works. And second, life is never quite as smooth as you want. But let's see if it works. So here we go. This is what it's like when the universe is expanding. Um, that was anticlimactic. Why didn't you work? Because... Let me just try it again. There we go. I think I just had the wrong thing. Right, so as the universe expands... You see, all the galaxies get farther apart, but the galaxies, in a sense, aren't really moving themselves. They are staying at the same point on the surface of the sphere. Um, but they are definitely getting farther apart as the whole sphere expands. And now I have been swallowed by the universe, and now we're going to get the gentleman in the front row. Um, so so it's, a, it's what we call a uniform expansion. The whole thing expands at the same rate, 
and all the galaxies get farther apart, the galaxies themselves don't expand. And of course, in the real universe, um, the galaxies are, you know, there's other physics going on. The, they attract each other, they run into each other, stars are formed in them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, let's see if I can make it small again. Can, good. Um, anyway, so that's what the expanding universe is supposed to look like. Does everyone else still hear me? I think everyone else still hears me. I hope everyone still hears me. Yeah, good, okay. Right, all right, so that's that's a you know that's a way of visualizing the way that um, yeah entropy has been reset. the arrow of time, all kinds of stuff has been reset. Um, that's a way of visualizing what we mean when we say the universe is expanding. It's a uniform expansion. Um, and so then the question is, how do we know this is happening and how do we measure things about it? So um, to do that, so think here about, I said a uniform expansion. That means the whole thing expands at once. I have gone down to a one-dimensional representation. Um, this is something I've sometimes done in class, um, in labs. I've done it with ages from uh, sixth graders all the way up to college students. Uh, you get a rubber band and you put a bunch of paper clips on it and the paper clips represent galaxies and you stretch the rubber band and the galaxies all move apart from each other and you can even make measurements of how far apart they are. So this is sort of the early state um, of the universe and, and, and the galaxies are very OCD in this universe. They all look exactly the same and they're perfect, yes thanks CZG, they're perfect uh, perfect distances apart from each other. And what I would just want you to notice is that suppose this is you here, um, this is the galaxy you are in, and you measure distances to galaxies. So here's one galaxy, here's another galaxy that's twice as far away. Then you expand the whole universe uniformly, just like we did with that ball over there. And here's some later time, here you are, you're still where you were. Um, you see the galaxy close to you has moved uh, away and the galaxy farther away has moved away um, but you notice the one that's farther away is still twice as far as the closer one which means that it has to have moved farther in the same time to keep the universe uh, the uniform expansion going and in fact the math of uniform expansion is pretty straightforward it's just that if you take the change in distance between one time and the next time and you divide by the initial distance that's going to be a constant if it's a uniform expansion. So something that's twice as far away, it has to get, um, the, the, the change in its distance has to be twice as much as something that was closer. So that's what a uniform expansion is, and that's the beginning of where the math for this works. So you would think now, hey, this is great. Now we know how to measure the expanding universe. We can tell it's a uniform expansion. Oh, okay. So that, okay, that constant is, that's a good question, Day. Um, it doesn't have to be constant over time. Um, what I mean, it's a constant for all the galaxies. So that means that the change in distance divided by distance for this galaxy, for this galaxy, for the next galaxy out, it's the same constant right then. But we do expect that constant to change over time. And I'll go ahead and give you some of the names. We call the Hubble constant the current value of the parameter that basically gives you this ratio. It's not exactly that, but I'll tell you what it is. Um, and the Hubble parameter is the value that has changed over time. So it changes over time, but it's the same for all galaxies, the change in distance divided by distance for any good thing. Yeah, so the Hubble parameter is the thing that changes. The Hubble constant is today's value of the Hubble parameter. It's just the, the standard jargon we use. Um, anyway, yeah, so now you look at this and you think, hey, this is great. We can see if we're in a uniform expansion by um, measuring distances to stuff, let the universe expand, measure distances again, and see if things that were farther away, if they moved more than the closer ones, and that'll tell us about our expanding universe. So let's think about doing that. Um, so, for example, the Virgo cluster is about 65 million light years away which means the light you are seeing from the Virgo clusters was emitted by those galaxies when dinosaurs were busy on the Earth dying, um, more or less. So you look at the Virgo cluster, it is 20 million parsecs away, it is very sad, um, and in 100 years it will have moved one ten millionth of a megaparsec, and so one ten millionth is a really tiny fraction of 20. In fact, it's one two hundred millionth. Um, so, 
I think I said that wrong, whatever, it's one five millionth, whatever it is. The point is, we do not measure distances anywhere near to one part in a million in astronomy. That's just hopeless. I mean, I, okay, yes, with the moon, we can do that, but not with galaxies. So, and that's waiting 100 years, which is a long time even for somebody in grad school. So, this isn't going to work. Uh, and this, and here's the other thing. This Virgo cluster is a really close cluster as clusters go. And the universe is expanding, but when you get to nearby galaxies, their uh, gravity starts to affect each other, and so they'll move in ways that's as a result of local effects, not just the expansion of the universe. So the Virgo cluster is not even the best thing to look at. Yeah, and as Vic points out, we're in the Virgo supercluster, which means we're part of a big structure that the Virgo cluster is part of. So we really want to look farther than that. And if you look farther than that, yeah, the the, dis, the change in distance will be bigger. But the farther away you look, the harder it is going to be to measure distances because things are dimmer and they're farther away. And so the same percentage um, change will be even harder to see with a more distant galaxy. So this is not the way to do it. We just we, The universe's expansion is on universe timescales, and it's not something that we could actually just wait and measure. So to do this, what we really need to do is look back in time because, you know, just waiting 100 years isn't going to work it, work. But if we can look back in time, then we can look at the universe as it was a long time ago and compare that to now. And then that might be a way to measure the expansion of the universe. Hang on a second. My monitor has started to die on me, and it just put up the little stupid... Uh, you know that thing where you change the brightness and all that and it won't go away? So I'm going to cycle the power on my monitor. Cycle the power is one of my favorite terms because it sounds like you're doing something really technical. All right, good. So um, we have an advantage, which is that um, the speed of light is actually really slow compared to the size of the universe. Now that sucks for things like colonizing the galaxy, right? It's going to be really hard ever to have space empires because the speed of light is not very fast and it takes huge amounts of energy even to get close to it so it sucks for space travel but when for cosmologists who want to look back in time yeah warp speed so if you guys can work out a way to generate a, a huge region of negative energy density we're good we can we can do warp speed um we can look back in time as cosmologists right because so here's the speed of light Usually people say, oh, it's 3 times 10 to the 8th. Well, it's 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. My favorite unit is one light year per year. That is the speed of light because the light year is defined as the distance light goes in one year. So there you go. Um, so the farther away something is, the longer it takes to reach us. So if we can measure how far away something is, measure, we don't have to measure the change in distance. Just measure the distance now. You know how, how far back in time you are looking. Um, so, some examples. The sun. The sun is eight minutes in, in the past. When you go outside and you look at the sun and you stare at the sun, you go blind. So don't do that. But if you look at the sun, you're seeing light that was emitted eight minutes ago because that's the sun is eight light minutes away from the Earth. If you go to the southern hemisphere, or if you're already in the southern hemisphere, which at least one person here is, you can go out and look at Alpha Centauri. Um, and there's even parts of the northern hemisphere that can, but not a whole lot of them. Um, Alpha Centauri is about four light years away. If you can find the Andromeda galaxy, that's um, two, about two million light years away. Uh, and the Andromeda galaxy is generally, for most people, the most distant object you can see with your naked eye without using at least binoculars. And if you're under a good dark sky, you can't actually find it. Can you see Andromeda from Australia? That's a good question. I get, I think yes, you ought to be able to. I don't think it's too far north. Um, it'll be fairly low on the horizon, but I believe you still can. Um, yeah. I don't know. I've never been to Australia, uh, so there you go. And then, you know, ignore this one because Z equals 1. I'll, I'll get into that later. But you compare this to the age of the universe, um, at the age of the universe is about 13.7 billion years. So that means that compared to the age of the universe, the Andromeda galaxy is, you know, it's very close. It's very recent. We don't have to think too hard to go and look at the Andromeda galaxy 
Um, we're not looking very far back in time. That means there's a whole lot of room in between where we can look at galaxies and see them and figure out how far away they are and look that far back in time. Um, wow, that's interesting. So in the northern hemisphere, the things that block us are clouds. I didn't realize that trees kind of came over with weather in, in the southern hemisphere. That's bizarre. Okay, so... Um, you actually measure look back time well you have to measure distance and there are a whole bunch of ways to measure distance and I'll briefly mention some of the others but one of the most common ones one of the most obvious ones is what we call the method of standard candles so a standard candle is a jargon name for something that has the same intrinsic luminosity every time you observe it just means it's putting out the same amount of energy so a 100 watt light bulb assuming incandescent light bulbs, is a standard candle, more or less, because it's putting out 100 watts of light every time you look at one. Um, and that's good. You know from experience that if you see something and you see another thing that's farther away, the farther away thing will be dimmer. And it turns out we can easily quantify that. It drops as 1 over the distance squared, if you're interested. And if you're not, whatever. It gets dimmer, and we can do the math and figure out how far away it is. So this is a conceptually straightforward way of measuring how far things away are. What's really, really hard about that method is two things. One, making sure you really have a standard candle. So if you have a whole bunch of light bulbs and you say, oh, the dimmer ones are farther away and the brighter ones are closer, well, what if they're all different light bulbs? Then you got that wrong. And that's, in fact, the case with stars. You look at all the stars in the sky and they're a bunch of different intrinsic luminosities. Um, Beetlejuice looks a little bit dimmer than Sirius in the sky, but Sirius is way closer because Beetlejuice is a big red giant star, and it's really luminous. Um, William Herschel made a uh, attempted a drawing of the galaxy by assuming that all the stars were basically the same intrinsic luminosity, which if you don't know anything else, yeah, go with it. Um, but if you really want to get precision you have to know that the thing you're looking at is a standard candle and that's hard and then the second thing is um, you actually need to calibrate that standard candle if you want to get absolute distances you have to know what the rate of light they're putting out now you can make some headway by knowing they're all the same even if you don't know what that exact brightness is um, for instance we didn't we were able to measure that the universe is accelerating only knowing that they were standard candles but if you want to measure the current expansion rate you have to know the intrinsic brightness so it's conceptually simple and it's very hard in practice and that will explain some of what you'll hear about now all right so that's looking back in time but we also need to look at how much the universe has expanded so if you remember what we did before yeah so Sisigi is talking about another thing that makes it really tough and was is part of the reason why there have been errors in the past in, in estimates of all kinds of stuff. Um, so before we were talking about look at a uh, cluster, wait, look at the cluster again to see how much the universe has expanded. Well, now we're talking about looking back in time, but we still have to know how much did the universe expand during the time we were looking. Um, and it turns out that we have this great benefit that light expands at exactly the same rate as the universe as light flies through the universe. Um, here's, a, here's a way of, well, first of all, wavelength of light, for those of you who don't know, I suspect a lot of you already know all this, but wavelength, light is an electromagnetic wave. Um, one of the things that confuses students is that uh, there's nothing going up and down about light. This, this wave thing that I'm plotting here is actually a strength of an electric field or a magnetic field. Um, but it's analogous. It uses a lot of the same math as a wave on a string. So we visualize it as a wave on a string, even though it's not really that. Um, you go from one peak to the next peak. That distance in space is what we call the wavelength. And we perceive wavelengths, at least within a, a small range, as color. So blue light has a shorter wavelength than red light. And then it can also go to what we call infrared light, which your eyes don't see, but it's the same physical phenomenon. And we can build detectors that see it. Um, shorter than blue light, there's ultraviolet, even x-rays, gamma rays, and we've built detectors to see all these things. And longer than near-infrared, you go down to what we call millimeter and eventually radio waves, and it's all the same thing. So light has a wavelength, and what I said is that light stretches at exactly the same rate as the universe. Here's a way of visualizing that. Um, this grid here is supposed to be a grid of a universe. So imagine that I had my 
universe ball over here and I drew a grid on it. Um, then this is one little piece of that grid is, is the light over here. And there's galaxies. And so the idea is that here's a galaxy. So this is us. We're in that galaxy right there. Here's a galaxy. It emits light. Um, I have shown that the one wavelength exactly fills one grid square. Um, and then this thing here, A, um, it has a name. It's the scale factor. But really, it's the grid spacing. It is the average distance between galaxies. It is something that is proportional to the size of the universe. And the reason we need that is that the size of the universe is not directly meaningful if the universe is actually infinite. So there's A. Um, let time elapse. The photon, the light, will travel from here all the way over to here. And it will redshift in so doing. So I guess I should have done this like this, right? Here's the photon. And as it's traveling, it redshifts. OK, maybe that was kind of pathetic. So and when it gets to us, it's now redder. The wavelength is longer. And so by measuring the wavelength, if we have some way of knowing what it originally was, we know that the ratio of the wavelength now to the wavelength at emission is exactly the same as the size of the universe now as parameterized by this A thing. And we use a subscript 0 for a bunch of things in cosmology to mean today's value. So A0 divided by A. Um, and then this thing redshift is the thing we actually measure. And Z is redshift. There's, there's just two different ways of describing how do I go from the redshift number to actual size ratios. The actual redshift number comes from when you look at a star or a galaxy or whatever with a telescope, the light, you send it through a spectrometer. A prism is a spectrometer. Uh, a pretty, oh, if you've lost vice, that means that you are now a good person without sin. Oh, OK. So if you put it through a spectrometer, a prism is a spectrometer. And practice more higher uh, quality spectrometers tend to use gratings or sometimes grisms, which is a combination of a grating and a prism. But light gets dispersed by color. You know about this from prisons, but uh, prisons, prisms. If you know about prisons, I don't know. That doesn't help you so much with astronomy. Um, one of the things we notice when we look at astronomical objects is we don't just see the rainbow, but we often see dark bands, little dark spots where there's less light. Or sometimes, especially looking at galaxies and nebula, we see uh, bright spots where there's a whole bunch of color right at one wavelength. Um, what's going on is that various atoms and molecules emit light or absorb light at very specific wavelengths. And so if you've got those in the thing you're looking at, they might take away all of the light of a given wavelength. Um, and then this, and so this is a very rich thing. You can do all kinds of stuff with that. But one of the things we're going to do with it is um, this is what the spectrum would have looked like if we had been um, seeing the light as it was emitted. But if the universe expanded in the meantime, and all the photons wavelengths stretched at the same rate, we would actually see something more like this spectrum down here. Um, how do we know that it's redshifted? Well, you notice here there's a pattern. And you can see that the pattern of all three of these lines has moved. And you can use that to figure out the redshift. Now, it also turns out that um, there are some lines that are very common. For instance, hydrogen is extremely common in the universe. So if you look at lots of galaxies and lots of stars, you not always, but frequently see hydrogen lines. And there's some others like that where it's not yet, it's not just the, uh, <laughs> oh my, it's not just the uh, pattern. And it, you actually can, can look and know what the species are and what's going on. Um, and it turns out also that you can use that to uh, try and identify what you're looking at. But that's another thing. And then we define the number redshift as just the observed wavelength minus the wavelength emitted, so the original wavelength, divided by the wavelength emitted. So this is going to be exactly the same as the change in size of the universe divided by the original size of the universe. So redshifts, although they need big telescopes because you have to get spectra, and spectra of dim objects takes big telescopes to measure, are pretty easy to measure. And we can actually measure them with pretty high precision. Um, it's the distances for the look back times that are really hard to measure. And those are the things that usually ended up, um, those are the things that usually end up causing all the trouble in the Hubble constant. So now that we know, and this is actually a plot that I will come back to later, 
Um, it's from a Wendy Friedman paper in 2001. Um, it, we now can basically plot the two things that we have. First of all, remember, we have the look back time. How far back in time are we looking? And then this, and, and I have kind of a tortured explanation of this, it's speed of light times change in distance divided by distance. Remember, change in distance divided by distance, that is how much the universe has expanded. Further to the right is further back in time. So this tells us how much has the universe expanded since this time in the past. And you put those two together, and it's a direct measure of the expansion of the universe. Now, it also turns out, now I have deliberately avoided talking about galaxies flying away from you, even though it, it looks like um, it, it, you know, it looks like it's happening, right? It looks like the galaxies are flying apart, but really a, a better way of describing what's going on in the universe, and there are some people who disagree with me on this, but a better way of describing it is you actually just say space itself expands, and the galaxies get farther apart because there's just now more space in between them. Um, so, um, however, if the galaxies are close enough apart... That turns out to be a slightly tortured way of talking about it. It just looks like the galaxies are flying away from you. And that's the way it was originally described, and some people still describe it that way. And if you think of it that way, a galaxy that is close will be flying away at a smaller speed than something that's farther away. But it means the same thing. Remember I said that something that's farther away in a given time has to change its distance more. Well, change in distance divided by time, that is a speed, at least dimensionally. Um, you know, and there's good relativistic reasons why I don't like to say galaxies are actually flying apart. But, uh, and I, I much prefer talking about size of universe as a function of time and how much it's changed. But this plot can show you both. And this is the traditional Hubble diagram. Traditional? Is that a word? Traditional Hubble diagram that is usually what people plot. Um, that, yeah, so it's not quite, yeah, Lucretius, it's not quite like a tattoo because the tattoo would get stretched along with. Uh, the universe, whereas the galaxies don't. They're held together by their own gravity. Um, so, uh, this is the Hubble diagram where you basically measure a bunch of distances, you measure a bunch of redshifts, you multiply the redshift by the speed of light, and you get something in kilometers per second, and you plot them. And then the slope of this is the Hubble constant. That tells you the current expansion rate of the universe. The steeper the slope, the faster the current expansion of the universe. And so the Hubble constant, if you look at it, well, Let's look at the Hubble constant. Um, the Hubble constant, we just define it as um, the change in distance divided by the distance, and that's a constant at a given time, remember, for all galaxies, if we neglect the fact that local galaxies orbit around each other and there's clusters and stuff. But once you're looking far enough away, any change in distance is dominated by the expansion of the universe. So change in distance divided by distance, and you divide that by the amount of time it took for the delta D. That is what the Hubble constant is. Now, the way it was originally talked about... Um, oh, yes, Vic has a good question. Um, oh, oh, my word, and I, the answer is on the tip of my cerebellum, and I can't remember it. Um, uh, wow. I feel terrible because I, that I'm not coming up with that name, but I forgot the name of my stand partner once also. Anyway... Um, yeah, so why aren't the galaxies expanding everything else? And that's, that's not a terrible question at all. That's an excellent question. Uh, because once you talk about the whole universe scaling up, you think, well, why doesn't everything scale up? Um, and here's the reason, is that the galaxies, so ultimately it's gravity. The universe is expanding because of general relativity, which is gravity. And if the universe were perfectly uniform, the whole thing would expand perfectly uniform, perfectly uniformly everywhere. However, it turns out the universe is only uniform on large scales. It's a little bit like the surface of the Earth, say. So from space, the surface of the Earth looks like a perfectly smooth sphere. Well, oblate sphere. Um, but if you actually go down and land on the Earth, you discover there's these mountains and valleys and things that mess up what's perfectly smooth. So from a great distance, you look on the large scales, it's very smooth. Um, you look on the small scales, you see little local hills and valleys. Well. The same thing's true of the universe. On large scales, it's very smooth. Henry at 11, thank you. Damn, I can't believe I forgot that. Um, on small scales, the galaxies are over-dense regions where there's 
lots of matter, you know, dark matter as well as regular matter, lots of matter all packed together more so than is average. And as a result, the gravity is stronger there. And so that local gravity holds the stuff together despite the fact that, um, that the universe expansion is trying to pull it apart. It's a little like if you put a paper clip on a rubber band. If you put a paper clip, just one paper clip on a rubber band, and you try and pull on the ends of the rubber band, you will notice that the rubber band is sliding through the two sides of the paper clip eventually. The rubber band is trying to pull the paper clip apart, but the, the paper clip's own structure holds it together. So that's why the galaxies don't expand along with the universe, because their own gravitational force holds them together. And the same is actually true for clusters of galaxies. So anyway, so back to the Hubble constant, you start with this, divide both sides by time, you now have delta d over t is equal to h naught d, or v if you interpret it as a velocity is h naught d. This is sort of the classic Hubble equation where d is the current distance to a given galaxy, v is the rate at which the galaxy is getting farther away, and then again everyone says, why don't you just call it its speed? Because uh, I get all hung up about speed. It's one of my problems. And then the Hubble constant is the proportion of um, the constant of proportionality, it's not the proportion of constantality, that's something else, the proportion. It's units, you can just look at this and see that the units for the Hubble constant, well, you're going to have to be kilometers per second to get a kilometers per second out, and you're going to have to have one over megaparsec, so when you multiply by megaparsecs, they go away. And then what's the value of the Hubble constant? And that's what we're all about. Well, the Hubble constant was first really measured, it's complicated. But let's go ahead and say um, Edwin Hubble discovered the expansion of the universe. And it turns out it, whenever you make a simple statement like X discovered Y, um, you're oversimplifying history. But whatever. I'm going to oversimplify history a little bit. There were a whole bunch of people, including Lemaitre and others, that were um, looking at redshifts of galaxies and trying to figure out what's going on there. But this is from Hubble's 1929 paper where he had distances, and it turns out there were problems with these distances, a lot of which had to do with the fact that he had completely miscalibrated his standard candles. So he had them right relative to each other, but because his standard candle turned out to be a whole lot brighter than he thought it was, he thought all the galaxies were a lot closer than they really were. So he got all his distances wrong. Um, but So he measured the redshifts were fine. He had good redshifts. He got his distances wrong. He plotted them. He said, hey, look, farther things are higher on this diagram than closer things, um, and he comes up with a measurement that's 500 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Um, and for a while, for a few decades, that was what we thought was the expansion rate of the universe. Now, this upset some people uh, because if the if that were the expansion rate of the universe, it's very hard to come up with a way for the universe to be more than a couple billion years old. And eventually we start to figure out that the universe, well, the Earth, is older than a couple billion years. And uh, to paraphrase Virg Virginia Trimble, it would be very upsetting to live in a universe where the stuff inside it was older than the universe itself. Um, oh, my word, you guys. Listen to this. Okay, good. I approve. Um, I, you know, puns are the fi highest form of humor, so, so that's good. So anyway, so this was off. Um, and, but, you know, this became a major important thing of cosmology. So v Virginia Trimble, who I just mentioned, um, she, uh, she's done a lot of review articles in, in astronomy. She, I don't know if she's still doing it, but she used to write every year a summary of the major discoveries of astronomy this year. And it's always kind of fun to read because she's a little, um, she's a little bit snarky and she's a little flippant about things and she'll, she'll toss off these kind of side comments that just make me chuckle. Um, uh, you know, things like not wanting to live in a universe where the constituent parts are older than the universe. Um, anyway, this is a review article she did in 1997, and that's going to turn out to be a uh, interesting time to have done this review article, where she looked at the history of the Hubble constant. Um, and so these plots, and the L's tell you, so it was actually George Lemaitre had an early measurement. These are Hubble's measurements. These first three are actually his first paper had 500, but he also gave sort of a range. He thinks, oh, it's somewhere between here and here. And then he and his um, students kept measuring it. And as time went by and we made better measurements, uh, the Hubble constant uh, our, the Hubble constant didn't change. Our estimate of it changed. So the Hubble constant was what it was all along. It, it, the universe hasn't expanded enough for the Hubble constant's value to have changed measurably. But 
measuring distance in astronomy is really difficult. And so, and in fact, if you look at this, eventually there was a time here in the 60s when you looked at these measurements coming down where it looked like the Hubble constant was going to cross zero, and by 1970 or so, the universe would actually be contracting rather than expanding. But, of course, that didn't happen. Eventually, the measurements settled down to what we now know is about right. But I've circled in red this region that is what it settled down to. And what it settled down to um, between about 1970 and 2000 was uncertain to a factor of two. In particular, there were two very prominent people um, who would publish um, De Vaucouleurs was one, and he would come up with values around 100 kilometers per second um, per megaparsec. And Sandage, Alan Sandage, and his uh, students and such would measure around 50 kilometers per second per megaparsec. And the size of this box tells you about the uncertainties they would quote. Actually, I think they quoted uncertainties smaller than this. So we have this problem that two people using more or less the same method to measure this constant couldn't get it right to within a factor of two. And in fact, in this Virginia Trimble article, she talks about a 1958 measurement by Alan Sandage, which was the first time somebody really did it pretty right, um, got all the calibrations right and fixed a lot of the calibration problems that had been going on. Sandage said that he didn't think his estimate, which was 80 kilometers per second per megaparsec, was better was no more was no better than a factor of two. Yeah, so yes, 42 is a, a very important number, and Sandage actually has claimed that at times, but alas, that's not really what it is. So, um, so he said it was no better than a factor of two, and Virginia Trimble writes that was the last time an honest error bar would be quoted on the Hubble constant for a very long time. So, um, because now, for, for after that, everyone would quote error bars. And it's really funny looking at these early things where they say, you know, Hubble says, you know, I have this, and it's good to within 10%, uh, when he should have said within a factor of 10. They're very much not the same thing. Um, so we have these differences. And when I'm in grad school, so somewhere around here, I go to grad school, um, starting in 1980, no, 1986 was college, starting in 1990, um, the Hubble constant, was it 50, was it 100? And it was more a religious thing, which one you believed, rather than a scientific thing. Um, a lot of people thought that Alan Sandage was the guy who was really doing it right, so therefore the Hubble constant had to be closer to 50. Um, the Hubble constant closer to 50 also made some age of the universe problems we had less of a problem, although they were still a problem. Uh, but the fact was that we didn't really know which was right. So, you know, this is kind of this embarrassing thing in cosmology that um, the most basic parameter of our model of the universe, the expansion rate of the universe, we couldn't measure to within a factor of two. Um, if you continue on into the 1990s, um, a whole bunch of people started getting involved in this, and there started to be more methods for doing this. But you can see it's still kind of a mess, at least through the mid-1990s. So these are all different measurements. The letters say something about the methods. It's not really all that important, although you should note that X, which is looking at supernova, managed to get both high and low values all at the same time. So that's fine. But there's a bunch of these different methods that have come in. and you know, by the mid-1990s, it's still not much better than 50 to 100. Maybe we've, you know, it looks like we're starting to center in around halfway between, which uh, I think Sissy Gee mentioned that. It's kind of ironic that Sandage and Vocalers, yeah, you're both wrong. <laughs> now, when I was in grad school, I was looking at Seifert galaxies nearby, and I didn't really, I wasn't worried about the expansion of the universe. I just wanted to use the Hubble constant to get distances to my galaxies from their redshifts. And like many people, I used... 75 plus or minus 25 as the value for the Hubble constant um, as a way of, of declaring that I wasn't going to choose sides. And lots of people did that back then. See, so what do these correspond to in billions of years? I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, this, what these are is Hubble constants, which are kilometers per second per megaparsec. Um, oh, yes, I see what you're saying. Um, this would, this number here, yeah, thank you. Uh, that was actually a question I should have known exactly what you're talking about. This corresponds to something like 9 billion years or 10 billion years if there's no dark energy. Um, and it turns out you needed dark energy to solve the cosmological age crisis. But that's, that's a topic for a different day. So um, you have all these things going on. 
And it's still uncertain to a factor of two. And Virginia Trimble said that some people are predicting that within the next few years we'll actually have the answer. And she predicted that in 2000, just a few years later, there still would be people who thought they knew the answer and were a factor of two different from somebody else who thought they knew the answer, and both of whom had good reasons for thinking they knew the answer. Um, but it turns out that she, was, she wasn't technically wrong, but 2001, we actually had an answer that most of the community started to accept. So Wendy Friedman, she's the one that I showed you the first Hubble diagram plot from, Carnegie Institute of Washington, the same place where Alan Sandage was, um, so both of them were there, um, finally came up with a Hubble Space Telescope result that looked not just from the Hubble Space Telescope, but lots of other data too, very carefully, and all the evidence did everything as well as they could, and came up with this value, 72 plus or minus 8 kilometers per second, and the value we have today is still consistent with this. So pretty much she got it right, and these error bars are honest too. Um, it turns out most of these error bars are systematic errors, which Sizigi mentioned. There's always systematic errors that are hard to do right. So this was sort of a tour de force. And of course, I say she, it's really they, because a whole bunch of people worked on this, including Barry Medor, who I think is her husband. But at one point, he sent me a bottle of wine because he was observing at Palomar and the telescope crashed. And he called me up at 2 in the morning, and I was able to recite a 120-character command to type in to get the thing to run again, because I had just been up there and had the same thing happen and accidentally memorized it. Little bizarre things that happen. Anyway, um, so this paper is basically the one that gave us our modern version of the Hubble constant. And since then, until recent troubles, um, all that's been happening is we've been improving the measurement, and it's, the value changes a little bit, but getting the error bar smaller, and we thought, hey, we've, we've finally gotten past this painful stage where the Hubble constant was unknown to a factor of two. And when I was, yeah, that's, that's uh, Andre, that's, that's what you do to fix everything. Um, when I was interviewing at Vanderbilt in uh, 2000, year 2001, actually, um, this was shortly before the Wendy Friedman paper came out. or maybe, Yeah, it was before the Wendy Friedman paper came out. One of the astronomers there said, so if you come here, will you do any rigorous science? And at the time, I was working on cosmology. I was working on uh, with Saul Perlmutter on the Accelerating Universe. Saul would go on to win the Nobel Prize. It turns out that's the kind of thing you want people at your institution to be working on. But he said, will you do any rigorous science? And I just kind of looked at them funny, like, what are you talking about? And he said, Cosmology is the worst sort of astronomy. I've been watching you guys try to measure the Hubble constant, and he was pretty old. He was in his 60s. I've been trying to, you, to, you, I've been watching you guys try to measure the Hubble constant for decades, and you still can't get it better to a factor of two, and you quote error bars that are way smaller than the difference between them. Uh, and I'm having a hard time kind of sputtering around and saying this because he's this old respected astronomer, and I'm a guy who's just a postdoc, and, uh, and, and he is just, with great confidence said that everything I do is basically kind of a waste of time and BS because cosmologists just don't know what they're doing. So, but that was actually a common um, belief amongst astronomers. Physicists, meanwhile, thought there was a whole group of physicists who thought that cosmology was the only thing interesting in astronomy. But the one thing that all academics will agree on is that people who are working on stuff different from me are wasting their time on uninteresting problems. That's the that statement is the only thing that all academics would agree on. So, um, lots of astronomers viewed cosmology as this a bit of a joke. That yes, it sounds like you're working on something fundamental in the universe, and it's really cool to think about. But you guys can't even measure your freaking Hubble constant. And it got better in 2001. Um, other things happened around that time as well. The cosmic microwave background we started getting good measurements of. We discovered the accelerating universe, which solved the age problem, we started getting actual measurements for mass densities in the universe that started to be consistent with each other. So somewhere around the turn of the millennium, cosmology changed. And in the 2000s, um, leading lights of cosmology, the uh, Michael Turners of the world started talking about how we have entered the era of precision cosmology. Um, and it's because you want to give something a multi-syllable name um, if it just means that, hey, we're actually measuring things better than we used to. That doesn't sound so good as we have entered the era of precision cosmology. So that's how you say it. And that was exciting. We finally knew the Hubble constant. Now, I am now going to briefly talk about a completely different thing. And the reason is 
all, everything up to now I've talked about for measuring the Hubble constant was what we call the cosmic distance ladder method. We are looking at relatively nearby objects compared to the universe as a whole. Um, and we are using things like calibrating brightnesses of stars to calibrate brightnesses of supernovas to figure out distances. All right. It turns out that even if the universe is infinite, there is this thing called the observable universe that is finite. And basically the reason is the universe has only been around for 13.7 billion years. So light can't have traveled more than 13.7 billion light years, although there's a whole bunch of stuff under the rug when I say that. And so there's a maximum light travel distance. So if this is you, any light emitted out here won't have reached you because the universe isn't old enough for it to have gotten to you. Right, so the observable universe is finite, um, and that right, so that's fine. So, so the observable universe is finite. The actual universe is probably infinite, or at least freaking huge. Um, there's another thing that remember as we look far away, we are looking back in time, and so eventually we are looking so far back in time that we're looking pretty close to the moment of Big Bang itself, insofar as there was such a thing, um, and. If you look to about 400,000 years after the Big Bang, you get to this point where the universe was so much hotter and so much denser that it was opaque, meaning that farther back in time, any light emitted would be scattered or absorbed by the plasma that was filling up the universe um, before very long. And there was a transition as the universe expanded and cooled off. It got just thin enough that when light was emitted, it would be able to stream basically forever after that, and very little of it got absorbed. You know, the occasional photon gets picked up by somebody's telescope, but it's not that all the gas in the universe is absorbing light anymore. So there's this thing called the surface of last scattering, is when you're looking back in time just the right distance. See what I did there? Distance, time, same thing. You're looking back in time just the right distance that you are seeing um, the edge of the opaque universe, when the last time the photons bounced off stuff before they were able to freely stream through the universe. And it's the same in all directions. In fact, this is one of the really big reasons the Big Bang model is a great model for our universe. It's the same in all directions. And we call this thing the cosmic microwave background. Um, this cosmic microwave background um, is a near perfect, if not perfect, black body, which is the spectrum that things glow at if they're hot. And so the whole sky is glowing like a thermal object at 2.74 degrees above absolute zero, which you probably don't think of as hot, because it's not. It's only two degrees above absolute zero. Uh, but why is it so cold? Because all the light was redshifted. So when it was emitted, it was close to a couple thousand Kelvin, something like that. Um, so yes, the universe is glowing. It is literally the afterglow of creation. We are seeing the glow of the entire universe back from when it was opaque because it was denser and still expanding. And it's pretty cool. And what's also cool about this is you look around the sky and it is consistent across the sky to better than one part in a thousand. And it turns out that most of that is just because um, our galaxy is moving relative to the other galaxies nearby. And when you subtract that out, it is smooth to something like one part in 10,000 or one part in 100,000. And that tells us powerful things, like that our galaxy, our universe, has to be pretty damn uniform overall for this cosmic microwave background to be the same in all directions. Now, we can learn a lot, and I'm not going to go into it because that would be a whole other talk or two. We can learn a lot by looking at the fluctuations around this. So I said it was good to one part in, here it is, good part to one, in, one part in 40,000. Well, there's all kinds of physics about the early universe embedded in these fluctuations. So we're looking at light that was emitted 400,000 years after the Big Bang, and it turns out these encoded in these fluctuations are information about what was going on then as well as stuff that was going on earlier in the universe. So we look at this and we can learn a lot about the universe and one of the things we can do is use this to measure what the Hubble constant is. Use this indirectly together with models of cosmology that are confirmed partly by all the details of this and this thing fits models of cosmology really well. Uh, part of why we believe our models are good. We can pull out a value for the Hubble constant from the uh, from the cosmic microwave background. And what's neat about this is it is a completely independent way of doing it from the other way. What we talked about before, we're looking at objects in the local universe. We're looking back in time no more than, I don't know, a billion years into the past, something like that. We are measuring stars 
almost always stars. Occasionally we're measuring nebula. If we're measuring galaxy, mostly it's starlight from the galaxy. We are looking at stars. It's dependent on the physics of stars to some degree. Supernova, our stars exploding. Right? We measure the Hubble constant using that. We also measure the Hubble constant by looking at the microwaves or the radio waves from the early universe long before there were stars looking back in time nearly 13.7 billion years you are looking at something very different so there are two independent ways of trying to measure the same thing if our models of cosmology were off base they should give very different answers um, if our models of cosmology are right they should give the same answer because um, they're both responding to the same physics and for a while they seem to be. This is a paper from 2014. The title is the 1% concordance Hubble constant. And again, remember, when I was in grad school, the Hubble constant was uncertain to a factor of two. The notion that we would start talking about knowing the Hubble constant to within 1%, I would have laughed at you if you told me that when I was in grad school. Um, uh, and then you would have laughed at me because I probably would have tripped and, and you know fell into a bucket of water. But that's something else. Um, and it, so and this is so the best distance ladder measurements were coming from uh, supernova Hubble Space Telescope stuff. They were getting about 73 plus or minus 2.4 kilometers per second. Um, so still more or less the same as what Wendy Friedman had. Um, Cosmic microwave background measurements by WMAP and the Planck satellite was starting to come on. We're getting somewhat lower values. But even though the numbers, say 67 isn't the same as 73, well, sure, but um, there's uncertainties on these. And when two things are different by less than, say, twice the uncertainty, you don't get too worked up around, about it. Um, you know, if you're, if you're doing uh, ecology, you would call this a p-value of 0.5, or sorry, 0.05, and you'd declare it a detection. But um, the fact is, there's a, basically a 5% chance that, that our measurements just would have given that randomly. Um, so when things are only something like two times the uncertainty apart from each other, you don't really consider that as a detection. Yeah, you know, it starts to be a little interesting. There's some tension there, but, you know, a 5% chance is an appreciable enough chance that we can't rule out that it just happened that way because of the random errors in our data. And so this was the concordance value they quoted, basically 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. And that was 2014. It got worse since then. So this is from a plot. So Wendy Friedman, this name keeps coming up. Turns out she's maybe important for the Hubble constant. Um, Wendy Friedman wrote a review of what's been going on. And what has happened is more recent Planck measurements have um, more data and are able to beat down the errors and get better measurements. So here you see these red things are the WMAP measurements from the cosmic microwave background. These blue things are from looking at the distance ladder. So this spot is actually from the 2001 Friedman paper. This is from a much more recent paper, I think an Adam Reese paper. Um, and we are now to the point where the measurements from the cosmic microwave background and local things are different by more than three error bars. That still will not be considered a detection in particle physics. It's still possible that it's just random chance, but the random chance is now down to less than 1%. So we start to get a little nervous about what's going on here. Um, so now we have this problem that we have a model of cosmology that's working really well. All kinds of stuff fit it, but when we use two different ways of measuring the Hubble constant, we get something that's a little different. Now again, this would be a dream state for me in grad school because the difference is between 67 and 72. And if you are used to the difference between 50 and 100, knowing that it's between 67 and 72 sounds really awesome. But the other thing we have done is we've improved the measurements enough that we can tell the difference between 67 and 72. And that's the fact that these error bars are so far from overlapping each other. And that's where we start to get into trouble. So you got to ask, yo, universe, what's up? We're measuring the Hubble constant, and we're not getting the same thing every time we do it. And we think we're doing it right. And here's a bunch of possibilities. One is you can just blame dark energy because that's a good thing to do because we really don't understand dark energy. So if something's going on in the universe, um, you start talking about dark energy and you say, oh, maybe dark energy has some local interactions or maybe there's stuff called dark radiation. Maybe stuff is going on in the dark sector and there's people who really work on this. So it could be that our models of the universe are not quite right just because the stuff in it is behaving a little different from what we thought. All right, that's a possibility. A more powerful possibility, not more powerful, a more far-reaching possibility is that there is new physics. Um, 
And of course, actually, dark energy itself probably needs some new physics, but it might be we're going to have to modify general relativity a little bit. We know that general relativity is very close to right, just like Newton's gravity is very close to right, but Newton's gravity gets Mercury's orbit slightly wrong. It may be that general relativity gets something slightly wrong that we have to modify. So it might be harder core new physics. It could be there's something going on about the universe between the time of the stuff we're looking at at the cosmic microwave background and the local stuff we're looking at. Um, of course, what, that could fall into either of these categories. Um, yes, yeah, Slack. Yeah, so, well, there's lots of things that are theorized. That is, in fact, one of them. What, though, Sissy Gee said much earlier that systematic errors are always underestimated. So one very likely possibility is that one or both measurements have misestimated systematic errors. It may be that the, that there's something going on in Planck where uh, they, they're measuring everything three too small on the Hubble constant and they haven't found the systematic error that explains it yet. You know, they've, both, all these teams have done a very careful job with their systematic errors, but systematic errors, by their very nature, are, you know, stuff in your data going on that skews your data. And if there's stuff going on you don't know about, you can't correct for it. So there may be something going on just with the detectors themselves. That's what happened with Hubble. He, the calibration he had for the stars he was looking at was way off. And so he measured the wrong value. Well, obviously, we're not off by that much anymore, but we may be off by enough to explain this difference. Um, and if I had to bet, this is probably the one I would bet on. The Wendy Friedman review article says that discrepancies like this in the past, sometimes it's systematic errors, sometimes it's a pointer to new physics. So you don't necessarily want to rule out one or the other. We keep looking for that sort of thing. But, um, uh, you know, if I had to bet, I would bet this one, but I'm not betting very much. I'm not even going to bet a full nickel because I don't want to say that it's not this or, you know, this is probably the, I don't know, all three of these would be pretty cool. Um, I want to know what dark energy is. And there is a, maybe a more extreme thing is where you throw out relativistic cosmology altogether. You throw out this curved universe stuff and you go back to something like Euclidean um, space with, uh, there was one paper I saw that um, said that maybe you could, replicate these effects if there's a gigantic empty Euclidean universe and there are local collections of galaxies that would act like different universes but really you could just fly from one to the other if you could fly fast enough and they say oh you'd see effects like this if that was happening now the problem I have with that is if something like that is going on we have to be really close to the center of one of them for things like the cosmic microwave background to look the way it does and one of the things history of astronomy tells you is that when you assume you're a special center position, you are wrong. That was the whole Copernicus versus Ptolemy thing that we used to assume the Earth was at the center of the universe. Why? Because, well, look at it. Everything's going around it. Clearly, that's what it is. And eventually, back a few hundred years ago, we figured out, oh, it's much better to say the sun is at the center of the universe. And then we figured out the sun wasn't at the center, even of the galaxy. And then we figured out the galaxy wasn't even the whole universe. So... This is why I say if you want to go back to some sort of non-relativistic cosmology, you have to um, ignore the Copernican principle that says don't assume you're at the center. And so that would be throwing Copernicus under the bus. Um, I don't want to do that. This is the one I absolutely would not bet on this one. Um, any of the others, to me, are entirely plausible explanations. And we don't know. And when will we figure it out? I don't know. It might be in the next two years. It might not be for two decades. But... Um, this is a big thing in astronomy right now. So lots of people are trying to make measurements to improve both the systematics and the uh, statistical errors so we can find out, is this, first of all, is this a real discrepancy? Or is it just, oh, it was a three error bar thing, and it turns out it just was an unlucky random bit. That's still possible. But um, maybe we'll find out soon. And so I will stop now and take any final questions. If somebody typed a question and I didn't see it, I apologize. Um, ask it again. And if anyone has any other questions, feel free to ask them now. How do we know we're not missing something really fundamental? Yeah, so that's always a possibility, right? The history of science shows that we're always you know, that we've missed fundamental stuff all along. Um, I think the reason I think it's different now is that we have a uh, mathematical model that we can make really precise measurements on on lots of different things. Now, Ptolemy's mathematical model was quite, quite precise, but um, 
we have uh, lots of different ways of looking at the universe that this same uh, general relativistic model fits all of them. So uh, if we're missing something fundamental, it's probably something really interesting, like evidence of higher dimensions or something like that, which, you know, maybe it would. It might be that dark energy is something really interesting. So yeah, probably there's stuff going on. We just it hasn't occurred to us that we haven't seen yet, you know, because you bet against that, you're almost certainly wrong. Um, but I wouldn't take that as a reason to be skeptical of cosmological studies any more than Kepler's measurements of and a model for Tycho's measurements of Mars's orbit were not something you could be skeptical of, even though we didn't realize that the sun was one star amongst many in the galaxy yet. So I think what we're looking at, we've got the basic idea right, but yeah, there could be other stuff going on that we just don't really have yet. Yeah, well, Vic is pointing out one of the things. There's all kinds of reason you can do. No, the size scales are vastly different, but um, you know, the the size scale of going from the sun to the galaxy was would have been boggling to um, people of that era. So uh, you know, in fact, one of the reasons people argued that stars weren't stars is that you should have seen parallax as the Earth went around the sun, and you didn't. And they tried to see parallax. This is one of the things that was argued for the heliocentric universe. Well, we eventually measured parallax, and why didn't we see it? Because the stars are also freaking far away. It was a really hard measurement to make. So uh, yeah, so I think I, th you know, I think we're in good shape for the cosmology that we have. Just like Newtonian gravity is a really good way of doing gravity for lots of things, but we know Newtonian gravity doesn't cover everything. And yeah, we're going to eventually figure out stuff that goes beyond the cosmology we know today. But I wouldn't say. I, I would be really surprised if we find out something that says everything we're talking about now is wrong. All right, let's see. Any other questions? But um, it's just not complete. So Newton's gravity is an excellent approximation for, for a lot of things. And it will be then maybe that our current cosmology is an excellent approximation for a lot of things. All right, so colliding neutron stars, Hubble constant, yes. Um, standard sirens is the term that is sometimes given for, um, for colliding neutron stars. Because you, you get gravitational waves from colliding neutron stars, and you make some other measurements, you can get a Hubble constant out of that. Now, so far, we only have one event. You're not going to get a Hubble constant from that. But as time goes by, we will see more, and that will give us yet another independent way of looking at the Hubble constant, and that will... Well, I was going to say it will shed some light on this, but really it's going to shed some gravity on it. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, but, you know, will it take a few years, 10 years? Eh, something like that. Yeah, it's very heavy. Uh, is dark matter the same as quantum foam? Uh, probably not. Dark energy might be the same as quantum foam, though. Because that's effectively va if dark energy is vacuum energy, quantum foam could be vacuum energy. Um, if it interacts with light, quantum foam, there have been people who have looked for the effects of quantum foam interacting with light. Um, there have been no convincing detections of that. Oh, this might, hopefully you're all hearing me now. Yeah, so um, I'm not going to talk about UFOs and aliens because this is a science talk. Uh, all right. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, I will be talking again. Actually, am I talking next week? I think I'm talking in early March. Um, and if I'm talking next week, that probably means that uh, uh, Jess is stressed that I haven't sent her a topic yet, which means I have to figure out my topic. Anyway, um, have a good day, everybody, or a good night if it's night where you are in the world, uh, and I will see you all later. Goodbye, everybody.